All right, guys, so we're here with Steve at Aquarium Zen, and uh, we're looking at this beautiful aquascape tank, and I'm just gonna turn it over to him straight away and have him uh, tell you a little bit about what we're looking at here, so. All right, so we have a 60H cube garden. This is a, about a 21 gallon tank. It's more, uh, if you're familiar with the 60P, it's a little, has a little more vertical height. Okay. Um, and so I really like that dimension. I like the height on this tank. I think it's probably one of my favorite tanks, honestly. Uh, so with this aquascape, honestly, I was going with some sort of vision of like a fantasy anime forest or something. I wanted like real vivid colors, kind of over the top saturated pinks and oranges. Spirited away or yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. why we have these little Totoro style plants here. Yeah. Hydrocotyl verticillata, little round, uh, perfectly round leaves. They remind me of little, um, you know, parasol, green parasols or sure. something like that. You can see a little fairy crawling. Exactly, you know? yeah. So we're going with that kind of fantasy effect with this tank. And it's been pretty effective. People really like this one. Yeah. And, uh, so for the hardscape, we have a central, just one piece of corn wood. It's very dense, Southeast Asian style driftwood that's um, popular with aquascapers. And we have like, you know, a uh, Nubius Nana Petite, just kind of uh, yeah. mounted as a canopy layer, so to speak. Now that's beautiful. How, uh, for folks at home, mm -hmm. you, did you take this off an existing? Those are very old. Clumps. I mean, this is a very slow growing plant. They'll put out maybe one leaf a month. So you could do the math. These are quite yeah, old. Yeah, and, it's uh, impressive. One of the challenges of keeping uh, a slow growing plant like a Nubius close to the light is that they will, they're kind of instant algae magnets. Mm -hmm. um, mosses are a challenge. The Nubius can be a challenge. So I've been more successful with keeping a little bit of a canopy of this That's smart. Uh, Rotella butterfly to kind of shade things out a little bit. That is beautiful. And then we get a pop of pink at the top. So it kind of plays off the colors here. Yeah, and, and another you know, sprig down in yeah. here. Yeah, and just kind of, because when I had the Nubius exposed, it looked cool for about a week. It looked like an actual tree with the canopy and the little leaves, and then it just went, it became an algae mess. So that's a bit of a challenge. I, Maybe you could remedy that with more frequent water changes, manual control of the algae, a lot of algae and type fish. There are a pair of dwarf cichlids in here, and they were knocking off my shrimp. So oh. I wasn't able to <laughs> control the algae with the mono shrimp, which would have been nice. Um, so anyways, it's, yeah, it just got a lot of color. This is Ludwigia ex lacustris. It's a natural hybrid that just has a very unique orange color that I really like. It's only, kind of a rare plant. Yeah, only occurs in about a dozen lakes on the yeah, East Coast. Yeah, on the East Coast, very rare, but uh, Native American plant, which is kind of cool. Love that we one. We have a Rotella mini butterfly, um, sure. which is very beautiful, you know, vivid pink stem plant. A little yeah. challenging to grow. Soft water uh, seems to be the key. You know, we're here in yeah. Seattle, we have very soft water, so we're lucky we can grow a lot of these more delicate plants. And I noticed that it's it's reaching sideways. Is there yeah. anything to that? Is it I just think it's the, a flow the water issue. flow? Yeah, the flow is coming from the uh, opposite direction, just sure. pushing it down. Because uh, this is the same plant in the back, and it's clearly gotten big. So it's a Rotella macaranda variety, from uh -huh. what I understand. Yeah. And um, this closer to the light actually looks in a, in a shade in a less a area with less flow. The leaves actually look pretty big. Yeah, they in do. In comparison to that spray down there. They do. And I'm not sure why that is. It might just be the light proximity. Um, but another cool plant we got in here is this uh, Cryptwentia green gecko. And that's a fun one. It has like a subtle red stripe down the midrib of the plant. And very easy to grow, like all the Wentia varieties. Sure. Um, a lot of these plants came out of tissue culture. These are the ADA tissue culture plants that we sell here at Aquarium Zen. Um, so, for example, the green gecko came out of tissue culture, the hydrocotyl, and the rotella. The um, Ludwigia is a plant that's not in commercial production as far as I know, so that's something I cultivate here on my, on my own. Yeah, and so that's actually a lot of the stuff you guys are seeing here. This is why I have it, is because I have this awesome shop here in Seattle and I'm able to come in and I've uh, asked Steve and he's very kindly cut off cuttings of some of these things. 
Uh, but that's why some of these things may look familiar to you guys. But his is also always uh, beyond what I'm able to produce as far as the uh, the layout and the sophistication. So uh, it's a real treat to have this open to the public, essentially. Oh, yeah. Thanks, you know? man. We're here to inspire people and help people. That's our goal. And so those are orange-eyed lemon tetras? Orange-eyed lemon tetras. Uh, they're actually reproducing in the tank. That's one of their that's offspring. Awesome. So uh, occasionally you'll see a little baby tetra just pop out. I think this is a rare, pretty rare tetra right now, but I think it's very easy to breed. If there was a dedicated breeder out there, you could easily produce a lot of those. They retail for around seven, eight dollars, which is pretty high for a tetra. Yeah. So um, and it's very beautiful fish. That orange color with the orange with the red eyes is very unique. Yeah. Everyone asks and, me where I get I got mine too, and. Uh, they're a very hardy f fish for what I've seen, too. Yeah, yeah, they haven't been a problem for me. And like I said, they will breed just sort of spontaneously in the aquarium, which is a nice feature, which tells me that if you're dedicated to spawning fish, you could probably crack the code and produce a lot of them if you wanted. And is that a Tucano? That's a lone Tucano. We had a group of Tucanos in here, but over time they've kind of aged and passed on. They're not very long the, Sure. Uh, fish as most of the nano fish are. Um, so we have one left. <laughs> <laughs> well, he stands out well. I mean, at first yeah, I was like, is that a black neon tetra? Yeah, no, it's not. No, it's got that color one, on its that, head. Yeah, it's another rare tetra that yeah. um, I think that would be a little more challenging to spawn. Yeah. But definitely worthwhile because that's one that retails around 16 bucks. So. Right. I still have two of these guys. <laughs> rare, rare fish, just uh, restricted to like one creek in the middle of Amazonian Brazil. In nature, so it's not something you, you see too often, and uh, very beautiful little fish. And I can see that it's actually eating some sort of microscopic yeah, uh, protozoa or right, you know something, something in there. Around in there, that's the beauty of plants and aquarium. You have this whole ecosystem going on of seen and unseen players. You yeah, know? and it's really fun. And then these guys, what are these down here? Uh, Oh, those are Adonis tetras. That's actually a West African species. Uh, really underrated fish. Very beautiful, gentle, uh, very subtle color pattern, but really nice. That's one of my favorites. For a nature aquarium, this tank I was going for color, and that's why I chose the yeah. the uh, orange lemon tetras because they're so vivid. But honestly, for a nature aquarium, I prefer fish that are more subdued, more subtle in coloration. Um, sure. Something evokes you know, something more natural and not so... You'd stumble upon. Yeah, something yeah. you'd see in nature, which is typically something kind of uh, subdued or camouflaged. And that's one of my favorites for that reason. Um, once you look at them closely, though, you'll really appreciate some subtle iridescence and yeah, um, striping on the fins. They're, it's a great fish, and they stay tiny. Um, not particularly um, difficult to keep, in my opinion, uh, as long as you have soft water. And uh, just awesome, just something to keep an eye out for. My wife always calls those the little silver fish that yeah. don't do anything. And I'm like, you know, with, same with Danios and Celestial Pearls. Uh -huh. But they have erythromicrons. People really need to give these a chance under proper lighting. Oh, yeah. um, you know, you give it some time and you look at them. And the amount of uh, iridescence, it's guanine crystals in their actual scales which form in a completely dry environment uh, biologically in each scale that causes fish to be reflective like that and the more of those crystals that they have um, the more reflection there is just like the the Pink Floyd logo the the prism it has that effect um, and that's actually where they picked up the idea for reflective paints and things on the roadways so um, a lot of that you can't see in pictures or even video, and so I just wanted to communicate to people looking at this tank that uh, there's a lot of that going on, a lot of beautiful subtle tones of red with the, the mm -hmm. yellow fish and things like that. And then, so lastly, you, will you discuss a little bit, this looks like a twin star light, yeah, or? Yeah, one of the twin star lights. And, it's uh, got I'm that really mellow. Happy. Yeah, I'm really happy with them. They definitely give a lot of pop with the, um, color color the color temperature but not too unnatural you know it's vivid but still looks pleasing to the eye to me it doesn't look artificial and it grows plants really well um, definitely 
probably for the bout for the cost one of the better lights on the market right now sure nice and slim and trim yeah. and then what do you have as far as filtration and then rate of co2 and uh, then your first regimen simple uh, we have a just an eheim filter tank mm -hmm. of co2 um, not the regulators just a cheapo one that, yeah. that we use that seems to work fine um, I use a very subtle amount of CO2. I can't imagine it being more than bubble uh, per second, probably sure. less. Uh, on, when I first set up a tank, I'll, before it has animals in it, I often crank the CO2, and I just get the plants established. And then once I add the fish or other animals, uh, I'll turn it down. And that just keeps the tank looking healthy, controls the algae, and, you get, and the plants, of course, look nice, and they get a steady growth rate in, in you know, contrast to like a really fast growth rate. Um, Makes use of that substrate, uh, you know, nitrates and things like that in an active substrate too. That yeah, and also when you're running a tank, it just when it's fully cranked with all the, the fertilizers and high intensity light, um, it's just a, a lot harder to balance, I find, you know, especially if you're new to this. Sure. And often you're going, you're oscillating between that like fresh haircut look of a really, you know, right. A, a, a manicured tank to like overgrown very quickly. So if you have like one tank and you like to tinker on it every day, yeah, definitely go high tech, really bright lights, a lot of fertilizer, less CO2. But if you if you like me and spread thin, have very little time and just want to have a beautiful aquarium in your corner that maybe you work on once a week. Like I do my maintenance on this tank for about 20 minutes a week. Wow, 20 that's minutes. It. Yeah, that's all it takes. And uh, and for me, that's more sustainable than a really intense, intensely managed aquarium with, you know, the high CO2 rate and that sort of thing. And then for carpeting, do you have any uh, have, little tips uh, on what's going well, on here? We have here? some uh, Monte Carlo that's been struggling. I think, you know, it's kind of getting shaded out by a lot of sure. the, uh, the growth above it. Um, and, uh, but it's, you know, basically got almost full coverage. Yeah, uh, we have we do have some mono shrimp in here, and I've noticed they're kind of kicking up some of the pebbles of the aqua soil and um, sure. and covering the carpet. So that's been a little challenge. So this zone in particular is having that issue. <laughs> sure. Uh, over to the right, but other than that, I'm happy with it. You know, I'm not a perfectionist. I just want something that overall has a pleasing effect, a nice energy to it, and that I think this aquarium succeeds. Um, in well, that regard. well, when you set up the hardscape or the skeleton of it, then you set it up for success. You're inoculating almost like a like a, a fungi or, or seeds or you know whatever you want to think of it as. But then it spreads on its own, and nature has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And to me, rather than trying to control it meticulously, oh, yeah. I like to watch where it goes. Well, you you have know, a vision in mind of what you're hoping for, and then the aquarium will kind of take it from there. And for sure. You work with that. Yeah, you know, it's like a back and forth sort of uh, communication between you and the aquarium. It has its own destiny in mind. You kind of you could fight that, or you could work with it. And I find you'll just be a lot more successful if you figure out what's working, focus on that, and ditch whatever's not working. Totally. Don't but, fight your water. But, you know, again, your... it's up to you. If you like to tinker and you find something's failing and you want to crack the code of what's going on, you know, go for it. It's yeah. just it's really everyone has goals and their, you know, sort of limitations. For me, it's time, Yeah. and I can't, I would love to do really detailed, highly manicured, diorama style, you know, aquascape, but I just can't, don't have the time for sure. that. So, you know, I'm just trying to create something pretty and grow some nice, but for me, when an aquarium is healthy and it uh, emanates that vitality into the room, into the space, to the viewer, that's really the essential thing. It makes you feel clean. It's a weird feeling. It makes you feel like, yeah, I just came out from the gassy fumes of traffic and the dirty day and gum on the sidewalk. Yeah. And then you walk in and you're like, pure, look at this pure, crisp yeah. Yeah, that's true. vitality. Exactly. Yeah. So that, it's very cool. And then so the last question yeah. uh, about the tank is just... Uh, What's your regimen of, uh, of fertilizers or anything like so that? I'm what using do you? The ADA uh, fertilizer products, the Bright okay. K and the Green Variety Mineral, um, and I will use those two products. And they're, they're like little pump dispensers, little squirt bottles. You guys who have uh, seen my channel, I have both of those, and that's what I am currently using also too. So you can see that in my other videos, you guys. So, so I find um, about five times a week I'll do. Three pumps of each one of those for the summer. Okay. 
and I say five times a week. Probably just want to do it every day, but um, you know, I tend to forget. Sure. A days a week. It still <laughs> so looks amazing. It's still fine. Um, yeah, I really like the ADA fertilizer projects. I, don't, I haven't had a lot of problem with the algae blooms with them, and obviously you get the results. Um, so I like it because you can it's, dial in the nitrates a lot yeah, easier than some of the like yeah, all in ones and things. It gives you uh, fine tuned control. Yeah. Fine, and uh, without having to really have a PhD in, <laughs> yeah. in, uh, <laughs> in chemistry, which I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah, and what what's this plant right? Here? That's a Ludwigia repens super red. That's the super red Ludwigia. All right. So. Uh, it's a little shaded out down here at the bottom, but um, when this screen of stem plants in the back, the Ludwigia and the Rotella, were shorter, then this really came up. You know? Sure. So, so you often see that when one thing comes into fruition and the other thing kind of declines a little bit. I had trimmed a bunch of the stems off. Well, and, and it's nice, too, because you've got... Um, kind of this hidden structure that comes and goes as you yeah. trim things. Well, and exactly. That's the fun of an aquarium. They're dynamic. They're going to yeah. look different from one week to the next. And you could play with that as an artist because you, you know, if, you, if you're a painter, it's like a static product once you're finished. Sure. The process. This process with the aquarium is ongoing for the life of the aquarium for as long as you're interested in it. And you can really, it's almost like a dance. It's a dynamic that yeah. you can surf no yeah That's for fine. sure yeah. all right well thank you very much um sure. well, you want to give a shout out to your store one more yes, time in seattle washington all right thank you so much yeah. and by the way i didn't mention at the beginning of the video but this guy has quite the credentials and he's uh he's a uh, what would you say curating and and designing the amazon sphere uh yeah manage aquariums for amazon headquarters yeah which have now been pretty world renowned and uh so that's pretty impressive he doesn't state it too much you know if you ask him but this guy knows what he's talking about so he's a, a real treasure to have in the neighborhood and uh in the aquascaping and uh, fish community here so thank you so much All Steve. Right, thanks, Alex. yeah